Well, I can't say very much in Spanish except gracias to my hosts and uh, to the organizers of this wonderful meeting. It's a pleasure to be in Colombia again. My first visit was at this meeting in 2009 in Cartagena, which was very nice. But I think what I saw yesterday um, in this area is beautiful, very unique part of the world. So I'm going to be talking on the severe and emergency presentations of celiac disease. So that's just for later, for translating. <laughs> so. so I'm going to start off with a complicated case presentation. It will highlight many aspects of what I'm going to talk about. So this is a patient that I first met after he had been hospitalized at the University of Virginia. I was at the University of Virginia for 10 years until last summer when I moved to San Diego with my husband. And this gentleman had been hospitalized a total of three or four times in different hospitals in West Virginia, which is a small state next to Virginia. He had three times brought into the hospital with low blood pressure, his kidneys were failing, and he had very low potassium. He was, had cardiac arrhythmias that were very severe. He had to be in the ICU many times. He didn't have a very significant past medical history. It was just hypertension and an inguinal hernia repair. He reported that he'd been having diarrhea for about three to four months before he started to get really sick. He was losing weight, and he found himself to be very weak in those three to four months before he got so ill he was hospitalized. He saw a local primary care physician, but never saw a gastroenterologist till later in the illness. He had a lot of tests done. Early on, his blood count was normal. His chemistry panel started to be abnormal when he got bad bouts of diarrhea. The potassium was very low, and he had evidence of dehydration with an elevation of the blood urea nitrogen and creatinine. His thyroid function was normal. He had multiple studies for looking for pathogens that Dr. Surowitz has just talked about. Some of them, nothing ever showed up. He had a CT scan of the abdomen, and again, Dr. Surowitz told you this is very common in the U.S. for people even without abdominal pain to get a CT scan. He had three colonoscopies, one on every time he came into hospital, and sometimes he actually had biopsies, but this didn't show any abnormality. He was transferred finally because he was so ill to the University of Virginia, and that's where my colleagues ordered an EGD in addition to another colonoscopy, and it showed the changes of celiac disease. So he was quite ill for this length of time and did not have the diagnosis made until about four months of being ill. He was started on a gluten-free diet, and, whoops, I skipped one. He, uh, he's, I, didn't skip one. He started a gluten-free diet. He had been started on prednisone in the hospital, and I met him as an outpatient, and I began slowly tapering the prednisone off. He was discharged to his home in West Virginia, which was six hours from our hospital, and he gradually got recurrent diarrhea. But his diarrhea was very severe, and within a few days of leaving, seeing me in clinic, he became very dehydrated and had low potassium. He couldn't be transferred to the University of Virginia because we had no beds, so he had to go to a local hospital. He actually went from three different emergency rooms before he could get to a hospital. So it, when he got back transferred to our hospital, we put him on corticosteroids. And later, as an outpatient, I put him on 6 mercaptopurine. I could have used azathioprine. And he eventually was stabilized and did well on 6 mercaptopurine. And gradually, I was able to table him off this immunosuppressive later when I transferred him to another doctor when I went to California. There is an entity known as celiac disease crisis. How many of you, first of all, in Colombia, look after patients with celiac disease? Some of you do. Have any of you heard of celiac disease crisis? A little bit? It's actually very rare. I've only had a few patients in my practice over 25 years, I would say, that I've seen maybe a handful 
of people with celiac disease crisis. One was a woman who was stable by the time I saw her in that she was on immunosuppressives for refractory celiac disease. But before she was put on immunosuppressive, she would get stable. And one time she was camping in northern United States and got so ill she had to be, go to a local emergency room, a small hospital, and she actually sustained a heart attack because her blood pressure was so low from dehydration. So this gentleman, I will tell you later more about his severe celiac disease, but these initial presentations would qualify as being celiac disease crisis. The definition of this syndrome is rather simple. Severe dehydration, kidney dysfunction, electrolyte disturbance, and sometimes weight loss. It can be the initial presentation of celiac disease, but I don't think in the patient I just told you about, the gentleman that um, was in West Virginia, I think it was overlooked his initial celiac disease and people failed to make the diagnosis and treat him. But it got severe enough that he developed these crises that required acute hospitalization. It can be a complication of ordinary celiac disease, but also with refractory types of celiac disease and celiac disease associated lymphoma. Typically, they require hospitalization, intravenous fluids, and typically electrolyte replacement, typically potassium that's being lost in the severe diarrhea. They often require steroids to treat the celiac disease initially, and often uh, some of the more severe cases, especially if it's associated with refractory celiac disease or lymphoma, will require parenteral nutrition. There is very little in the literature, usually case reports. There is one case series from Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital with Karen Kelly and Dan Leffler and other celiac disease experts in that group. All of them had at least partial total villus atrophy consistent with the Marsh Stage 3 or total villus atrophy. Uh, in the series of these 11 patients, uh, um, only a third of them had total villus atrophy, but it tends to be a more severe type of celiac disease that we see this crisis presentation. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about non-responsive celiac disease. It's not really an emergency presentation, but it is a severe presentation that's relatively rare. Perhaps about 5% of people with celiac disease have refractory celiac disease, and I will talk about that. Non-responsive celiac disease, by definition, means that people are not responding to a gluten-free diet. There, this could be due to many different things. The most common one is that the patient isn't actually gluten-free. They don't understand the gluten-free diet. It's very complicated. Or they buy something that they're told is gluten-free, but it turns out the person who's making the bread for them is using wheat flour or some other grain that has gluten, and so that they keep eating it, either unintentionally or on purpose, just because they don't like gluten-free food. There are many coincident disorders that can masquerade as causing cramping, diarrhea, and make us think the patient is not doing well from their celiac disease, but it's something else that can coexist at the same time as celiac disease. And perhaps one of the more common ones is lactose intolerance, pancreatic insufficiency sometimes. Sometimes these patients with celiac disease can also have intestinal uh, overgrowth of bacteria in the small bowel, microscopic colitis, and sometimes a coincident irritable bowel syndrome. Because celiac disease is relatively common now, 1% in most of the genetically susceptible parts of the world, which include all of Europe, North Africa, the Mediterranean area, um, uh, the Middle East, and also South Asia, Pakistan, and India. So I've been talking to colleagues in Mexico who are seeing more and more celiac disease. The same is true in South America. I think a lot of populations, the genetic background could be uh, susceptible to develop celiac disease. So another thing in my practice that I see is that this is not really celiac disease. 
Sometimes the patient uh, gets a biopsy taken and the pathologist who reviews it is not expert. I just saw a patient um, from Mexico come to see me and he went to Houston and had actually a colleague of mine who's from Mexico, did his EGD and the biopsy was reported as having celiac disease. This gentleman came to see me in San Diego. He's very, very gluten free. He's a very famous chef and he is not getting better. He has long-standing irritable bowel syndrome, and I checked his celiac disease genetics. He doesn't have the genes that could give him celiac disease, so now I'm waiting to review his biopsy because I don't think he has celiac disease. So this is another not unusual reason for patients not to respond to the gluten-free diet because it's not celiac disease. What I'm gonna talk about mainly now is the complications of severe celiac disease, refractory celiac disease, and malignancy a little bit. So just briefly about lactose intolerance, I think probably you all know that lactose intolerance is very common. Most of the world is lactose intolerant once they get into adult life. People from the Mediterranean, people from all parts of Asia, people from Africa, which means in North America and South America, Central America, lots of our population have blood from uh, uh, genes from races that are lactose insufficient as they become adult. So it's not a very uh, rare condition. And then there's a second reason in celiac disease patients is that the damage of celiac disease for a while will not allow the lactase enzyme to act uh, be in the present because of damage to the villi. So the secondary lactase insufficiency also comes from viral infections, gastroenteritis, chemotherapy, and many things that damage the small bowel, like Crohn's disease. So typically, when celiac disease gets better, lactose intolerance will improve. Another disease just to, worth talking about is the overlap of microscopic colitis and celiac disease. So a patient who does not get better on the gluten-free diet, typically it's a good idea to do at least a sigmoidoscopy, but I, depending on the age of patient, a colonoscopy to take biopsies of the mucosa to look for either lymphocytic colitis or collagenous colitis. These are the two forms of microscopic forms of colitis and the pathologist can differentiate between them, but the treatments are very similar. Some patients will respond with a gluten-free diet, and with time, the lymphocytes in the colon will disappear. Other individuals require specific therapy, just as if they had microscopic colitis without celiac disease, and that may require corticosteroids, such as budesonide, possibly some of the mesalamine-related drugs. Now, what was interesting in Peter Green's study that I describe here in this slide was that initially, um, when I was training, we were told we needed to take biopsies in the right colon to make the diagnosis of collagenous colitis. Then studies came out that said as long as we took the biopsies above the rectosigmoid area so that we didn't see increased fibrosis and collagen layers in the rectum. If we took it in the proximal sigmoid, we would be fine. But in this study of Peter Green's, they showed that 16% of the patients with microscopic colitis, it was isolated to the right colon, which may make us rethink that we need to do biopsies throughout the colon to make this diagnosis. So this is a study from London, England, King's College, where they looked at non-responsive celiac disease, and they looked at their patients over an 18-month period and categorized 112 patients that were referred with non-responsive celiac disease. They found out by reviewing the biopsies that 12 of them didn't have celiac disease that left them with 100 that actually had this diagnosis. You can see that 45% of them were non-compliant with this, uh, the gluten-free diet, but in over half of them, it was inadvertent. So I don't like to use the word compliance. It's just that they are not on a gluten-free diet. It doesn't imply that it was a mistake on theirs. Sometimes they don't realize it's not necessarily uh, intentional noncompliance. 12% of them had microscopic colitis. 9% had small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. 9% had refractory celiac disease, and three had lymphoma. After two years in this retrospective study, 78 of them were doing very well on a gluten-free diet, eight of them had continuing symptoms, and four of them had died 
from the group that had the refractory celiac disease, uh, and particularly the ones with lymphoma. So how do we evaluate these patients with non-responsive celiac disease? Again, it's not really truly an emergency. Only the celiac crisis is an emergency, but some of these patients are very sick, and one of the things when it's just non-responsive, you want to make sure that you're dealing with celiac disease, you want to look at their diet, their medications, to look at whether or not they're ingesting gluten unintentionally. You want to evaluate and potentially empirically treat them for all of those things that are associated with celiac disease, lactose intolerance, pancreatic insufficiency, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and microscopic colitis. You also can assess for complications of celiac disease, and this may require a capsule endoscopy or endoscopy to look beyond just the regular EGD. Some of these individuals may have ulcerating forms, stricturing, collagenous forms, or even malignancy, and this group would come in the category typically of refractory celiac disease. Then the next step, if you think you're dealing with refractory celiac disease, is to do special testing, which usually involves sending your samples to tertiary care centers to look if there are any clonal changes in the T lymphocytes in the biopsies. In the U.S., we typically do immunohistochemistry of the T cells, or we do PCR to look for gene rearrangement of the T cell receptor. In Amsterdam, Chris Mulder, who is an expert on refractory celiac disease, does um, flow cytometry to look at the T cells, but in the U.S., we typically don't take enough biopsies to get enough T cells. He says he takes maybe 8 to 10 biopsies, but I think he must use a very big biopsy forcep or he's more skilled at getting the T cells out. So this is my experience of my practice at the University of Virginia. We looked at cases with the help of a GI fellow. Um, he's now at Duke um, University where he's doing his GI fellowship. He was a resident at the time. We found in the 10-year period we looked that we had 272 patients with celiac disease that was biopsy proven, uh, thought to be biopsy proven. 90, um, sorry, 69% were women, 96% of them were white, 97% of these patients had the refractory or non-responsive form of celiac disease, and again we found a fair number of them, a third of them were non-compliant with the gluten-free diet, 21% had irritable bowel syndrome, 10% had microscopic colitis, 5% gastroparesis, 4% intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and 3% pancreatic insufficiency. You, will, you can't add this up so quickly, but it doesn't come to 100% because some people had more than one cause of this non-responsive celiac disease. 13% had refractory celiac disease. So what, how do we define somebody as having refractory celiac disease? So experts have come to this general description of what would qualify for refractory disease. It has to be villus atrophy. They can't just be symptomatic. You have to go biopsy them again and find their biopsy to be abnormal, usually as abnormal or perhaps even worse than the initial one, depending on how long that the patient has been between the diagnosis and seeing you in your clinic. They have to be strictly adherent to a gluten-free diet from anywhere from 6 to 12 months. So you can't label someone as uh, having refractory celiac disease when you first see them if they're not being treated. So it turns out that most tertiary centers, places like Mayo Clinic, like um, Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, different centers, this is a really rare diagnosis, perhaps in the order of about 5%. Usually we see a secondary form where they initially did well, but after time they don't respond to this gluten-free diet anymore. And we call this a secondary form. The gentleman that I'm presenting to you in this, in this session, the case scenario, has the primary form perhaps because he never had a chance to be on a gluten-free diet. He was very ill with his celiac crisis presentations, and then he developed, um, then he really went on to a refractory celiac disease type of presentation that was managed with being on corticosteroids. What happens is the gluten-free diet no longer works for these patients because the T cell is autonomous. It continues to be activated, 
and produces cytokines like interferon gamma that damage the intestine and cause the celiac disease enteropathy. And at that point, the gluten-free diet doesn't make any difference. Even though typically we tell them to stay on the gluten-free diet, they need steroids to destroy those T-cell clones that cause the damage. That's the main treatment. And then we use steroid-sparing types of therapy. There are many different variants, as I mentioned already, collagenous, stricturing, and ulcerative. We believe that as patients get older, their risk of celiac disease is greater. There are two main forms, the type 1, which they don't have the abnormal T cells yet, and then the type 2, which is more severe. We call it a pre-lymphoma state because the T cell gene rearrangement has occurred, and we have this clonal expansion of the T cells that could go on to lymphoma, and it does in some of these patients. Now, Many of you have heard this adage that all that flattens is not celiac sprue, so there are many other things that can look like bad celiac disease. And these are a number of, of studies that talk about the differential diagnosis here from, uh, from Chris Mulder and also from Joe Murray's group at Mayo Clinic. It can be an adult onset autoimmune enteropathy. Here, the way to make that diagnosis is to look at the antibodies to the enterocytes or the goblet cell. Common variable immunodeficiency. A good pathologist will notice that there are no plasma cells, and they have reduced serum immunoglobulins, typically IgG, IgA, and IgM. Tropical sprue can be mistaken, but not usually with a good pathologist. Collagenous sprue is a variant of celiac sprue. Eosinophilic gastroenteritis, typically, again, the pathologist will see a lot of eosinophils. In celiac disease, you only get a small increase in eosinophils. And occasionally, Crohn's disease can be mistaken for refractory celiac disease. So here was a study that came from Karen Kelly's group at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, presented at DDW in 2010. They looked at non-celiac enteropathy. They looked at all of the cases they had of total villus atrophy in the duodenum. 30 cases were non-celiac. 24 of them had the HLA test that makes people predisposed to celiac disease was negative. 26 did not have the TTG IgA antibody that's quite specific for celiac disease. And 10 of them had no increase in enteropathelial lymphocyte, which is usually a hallmark of not having celiac disease enteropathy. 21 of them were misdiagnosed as having celiac disease. One was labeled gluten intolerance, which we now think is not, a, it's an exclusion of celiac disease. And some of them had no improvement, and some had no biopsy improvement. And the most common in this group of 30 was the autoimmune enteropathy. One third of them had that disease. So this is the classic total villus atrophy or almost total villus atrophy here. And the arrows are pointing to the increase in the intraepithelial lymphocytes in the surface epithelium and in the lamina propria. You can see the plasma cells that are increased um, up there in the lamina propria. So the arrows are showing these abnormal T cells. And this is what the pathologist, if they were looking, they could not differentiate refractory celiac disease between severe celiac disease. It is a clinical diagnosis associated with a typical biopsy. It's only when we find clonal changes on the T cell with immunohistochemistry or uh, molecular diagnostics doing the PCR test that in conjunction with the clinical setting, we can then label them two types of refractory celiac disease, either with the clonal change, type 1, or type 2, if they um, don't have the clonal change yet. So the prognosis of refractory celiac disease is quite poor. 50% of those with type 2 will die within 3 to 10 years, usually due to uh, lymphoma infections because they're very malnourished or immunodeficient and intractable diarrhea. The five-year survival rate for the uh, type 2 overall, the different studies, is 40 to 58 percent. And the better prognosis is the ones without the clonal changes. But it still has a higher mortality than ordinary patients with celiac disease who are doing well on a gluten-free diet. This is one study published in gastroenterology, the, the sum total experience in France they looked at many different reference centers, and they found 14 patients 
with the type 1 refractory celiac disease, and they actually had a lot of them with the more severe type, but this reflects the referral bias of patients going to these tertiary hospitals. And again, they looked at their patients and saw that malnutrition, ulcer of jejunitis, and a lymphocytic gastritis were com more common in the patients with the refractory celiac disease type 2. And overt lymphomas occurred actually in two patients with the earlier stage, but 16 of them had refractory celiac type 2. So this abnormal phenotype is important to look at, and they found that this was quite predictive of a poor outcome. And again, the five-year survival rate in this particular study was 93% in the type 1, but 44% with type 2. So the Mayo Clinic, Joe Murray, reported his experience also in gastroenterology in 2009, and he had a total of 57 patients with this um, RCD. Uh, type 1 was more common in that population, and type 2 was uh, rare, 15. And I think this is typical of the North American experience from Boston, Mayo, my own experience, is um, that it's not quite as skewed as the French study. And they looked at the patients with type 1. They had quite a good prognosis, relatively speaking, 80% uh, five-year survival and 45% for the type 2. And they looked at various factors to try and predict an older age, a low albumin, a low hemoglobin, and total villus atrophy was predicted by a much poor, poor, uh, poor outcome with these features, which really are just reflective, in my mind, of most of them of very severe malabsorption and nutrition. This is the res these are results of the Beth Israel Deaconess population. 34 of their 844 patients that were reported in 2011 had refractory celiac disease. That was only 4% of that patient population. Only five um, patients had the type 2 refractory disease, but two of them died of the enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma within 24 months. And there was a lot of symptomatology, unintentional weight loss, and diarrhea diagnosis was common. So this led the authors to speculate that refractory celiac disease in North America seemed to have a more mild course than in Europe as based on the Dutch and the French experience. So this is our experience at the University of Virginia. 19 of our 97 patients who were non-responsive had refractory celiac disease, 20%. Three of them um, were type 1, 14 type 2, but we did not use immunohistochemistry, and we have since learned that the PCR testing is overly sensitive, and we're now going through and, and typing them with immunohistochemistry. Two of the patients of this 19 died, one with the enteropathy T-cell lymphoma and one with a neurological inflammatory disorder that was never diagnosed. So my take-home messages for you are there are multiple causes of non-responsive celiac disease. Neither, none of these are typically life-threatening if we can figure them out. However, a small subset of these people will have truly refractory celiac disease. It's not from eating gluten. And these are the individuals who can go into a crisis mode. They can die from lymphoma. They may die requiring TPN, and so they are a form of a severe presentation, perhaps not an emergency. You do need to recognize a celiac disease crisis. If someone comes in like that gentleman from West Virginia and you're asked to consult, make sure that celiac disease has been excluded as a possibility for recurrent diarrhea, because we all are used to the milder presentations of celiac disease, but this gentleman might have been saved five or six hospitalizations if someone had made the diagnosis for him initially. So thank you very much for your attention.